whenever I get the opportunity to preach, uh, it's not my favorite. I like it. I don't, I don't not like it. Uh, preaching and teaching in general, I love it. I do it every week. I teach on Wednesday nights for our students. I teach our college Sunday school class. Uh, but those are easy because I know what I'm doing. Because like we're in Genesis right now in Sunday school, so I know, okay, after 31 comes 32, after 32 comes 33. It just makes sense. That's the way it goes. On Wednesday nights, we do series, so I know, hey, for the next 12 weeks, this is what we're doing. But when I'm asked to preach, Alan says, hey, will you preach? And I say, yes. Anything you want me to preach on? Nope. (laughs) So I love doing it, but it's the getting here that's like, what what are we going to do? What are are we going to do with this time that we've been given? So uh, last Sunday, still didn't know. I was still on the fence. I had some ideas, but I was like, you know, I just don't, you know, we could talk about life group. We're starting life groups tonight. Uh, We're doing a book on the local church. I could do a passage talking about the church. That was a good idea. And then I was sitting here listening to Alan's sermon last week, and he was talking about the great fish and how in the New Testament mentions that Jonah is a sign. And I was like, okay, this is a good idea. Let's see, where does, is Jonah mentioned in the New Testament if he is where? The answer is yes. The answer is twice. And he's mentioned in Matthew chapter 12 and Luke chapter 11. And Jesus mentions Jonah. And so this morning, because I want to stick with the theme, that helps me. I like that. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 12 and we're going to be in verses 38 to 42. Matthew chapter 12 Verses 38 to 42. If you'd like to turn there with me, I would love that. So now that we went through all that, now now I'm glad to be here. I'm happy to be here now. We got through all that. We know what we're doing. Okay, here we go. Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 42. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher, We wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Let's pray. Father God, I'm thankful this morning for your word. God, I'm thankful for the opportunity that you have given for me to preach it. God, I pray that we would be faithful to the text this morning, that we would be faithful to your word. God, I pray that anything that comes out of my mouth is honoring to you. And God, I pray that anything that I say that is not honoring to your word, that it would be forgotten, but that everything that I say that is honoring to you, faithful to the text of scripture, that it would sit on our hearts and that we would dwell on it, that we would seek to grow from it, that it would help us to be knowledgeable about our salvation in Jesus. I pray that it would help us to live our lives in a way that's honoring to you. By the power of the Holy Spirit, would you be with us? It's in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so for context for this passage in in Matthew chapter 12, uh, we see Jesus having multiple disputes with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, as most of you know, are kind of the religious elite in the Jewish community. Uh, Specifically in the passage, once we get to where we're at in in verse 38, it's scribes and Pharisees. So these are two different groups, but both religious elite in the Jewish community. And so we see Jesus throughout chapter 12 having multiple disputes 
with the Pharisees. This all begins in verse two with the Pharisees questioning Jesus about why he allowed the disciples to pluck the head off of grain to eat it and to eat it on the Sabbath. They were questioning him. They keep trying to get him into spots where, hey, we're trying to back this guy in a corner and we want him to show himself to be a false teacher. That's basically what's happening here. And then uh, it continued in verses 9 to 14 when Jesus healed a man with a withered hand and they're, they're questioning him about that. They're, why are you doing this? How are you doing this? They're, they're questioning him. They're, again, they're trying to back him into a corner. And then it reached its climax when the Pharisees speculated that Jesus was casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul. That's verse 24 in chapter 12. And Beelzebul, they're saying he's, he's working on behalf of Satan. They're saying this guy is casting out demons for the devil. And remember, this is Jesus. And so Jesus responded with a very harsh warning about the unpardonable sin and the importance of a good heart as opposed to an evil heart. And so we have this, this dispute going on and on throughout chapter 12. And then we land here. And we see the request. And so this morning, I'm going to go through and I'm going to hit the request and the response. And the response has a few different parts to the response. And then we're going to, then we're going to end out there just so you guys know what's happening. I don't have an outline on the screen. Sorry in advance for that, but we have this request, right? In verse 38, teacher, we wish to see a sign. We wish to see a sign. Now these Pharisees and scribes, they've been around They've been in the vicinity geographically. They've, they've know people are talking. They know what Jesus is doing. They've seen Jesus heal people. They've seen Jesus cast out demons in just a couple chapters ago, which time-wise probably wasn't that long ago. Jesus calmed a storm. Surely people were talking about that. They had seen Jesus do all kinds of things. They had seen signs, yet they still wanted more. They hadn't seen enough. And I think we've all been in this mentality, this space of mind where, where we think we've got a good idea of what we need to do, the decision we need to make, this is the right way to go, but maybe it's the thing that we don't want to do. Maybe it's the thing that's a little more uncomfortable than the way we shouldn't go. And we say, ah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what you want me to do, but would you give me a sign? Would you help me out? Would you help me know that that's the way I'm supposed to go because it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be comfortable? So would you give me a sign? We want more and more validation because we don't want to do what's uncomfortable. We want, don't want to do what's not our norm. And so we've all been in this mentality. I think, I think sometimes when we read the New Testament, when we re read the Gospels, we see the Pharisees and the scribes and immediately we want to say, those are the Pharisees and the scribes those guys were out to lunch. Like I, well, I would never act like that. I would never talk to Jesus like that. Let's not be so prideful to say that. And let's say, hey, I, th I, think, we could, I think we could be in this mindset. Jesus, we need a sign. We need another sign. Yeah, 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 we've seen, we've seen the stuff you're doing, but we need a sign. Like give us a real sign. And so, these were the religious elite They were versed in the Old Testament. They should have known that Jesus was the Messiah because of the things that they'd seen, the things that they'd heard, the things that he's saying. They should have known because of the circumstances surrounding even his birth, even his ministry, the way that he carried himself. They should have known that Jesus was the Messiah, but they want more. Their hearts were hard, so they didn't want to believe it. And Paul puts this verse in this passage in perspective for us, for the Jewish people in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 to 22. Paul says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Verse 22, for the Jews demand signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The Jews were, this was normal for them. 
They, were, they had hard hearts. They didn't want to believe. They always wanted a sign. They wanted more signs. Let's see more signs. I, I haven't seen enough. I want to see more. And we see this in the Old Testament. The, the Israelite people were hard to please. The Israelite people were, what have we done in Sunday school? They were always struggling with God. They were quarreling with God. And so we see this. This is normal. They hadn't seen enough. And so let's look at Jesus' response. The first thing he says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. A little harsh, evil and adulterous. Why does Jesus call them evil for seeking this sign? Why does he call them evil? Basically in scripture, we see instances of people seeking a sign, asking for a sign and being condemned for it. But we also have instances where people are not condemned or reprimanded or or punished or anything. We have instances where people are asking for signs and, and nothing is said about it. The sign is given and we move on. Gideon is a great example of that. He asked for a sign. He goes and does what God says to do. He wants more signs. God never comes to Gideon and says, why don't you just believe? God never says that to Gideon. So why are the Pharisees and the scribes an evil and condemned generation? But Gideon was fine. Let's look at a couple of examples. In Exodus chapter 17, the Israelites had just crossed the Red Sea into the wilderness so they've, they've seen God's faithfulness to deliver them. If you remember the Exodus narrative, they've seen signs from God. And not just signs, they had seen signs from God. The river running with blood, frogs running everywhere, locusts going crazy. They had seen signs from God. Not to mention the fact that when they're leaving, they get a, a royal escort, traffic, parting of the Red Sea, right? They had seen signs. But when they're in the wilderness, first of all, that God gives them bread from heaven. They wake up in the morning and there's just bread on the ground. They'd seen signs. But they find themselves in a place in the wilderness where there is no water to drink. I don't know if you've ever been thirsty If you've ever been thirsty for a long time, it can be a little frustrating, maybe a little maddening, but they demand that Moses give them water. And he warns them that they're not testing him. He says, you're not testing me. You're testing the Lord, your God. Why are you asking me for water? Can you trust the Lord, please? And just hold on. Moses is like, guys, I'm tired of you all. Like we just... We just did this whole thing and now you guys are already complaining. They're demanding water. They want water. They're thirsty. They want water for their animals. They want water for their kids. They want water. But Moses says, hey, you're not testing me. You're testing the Lord. Be careful. But they continue to complain. They continue to demand water. And Moses cries out to God and says that the people are basically about to kill him because they want water so bad. So the Lord instructs Moses to pass by all of Israel with some of the elders of Israel and then hit a rock with the staff that he parted the Red Sea with. Hit a rock with the staff. And water flows from that rock and gives all of Israel and all of their animals enough to drink. It's an incredible sign. And Moses named that place Massah because the people quarreled and tested God what that word means and then in Deuteronomy chapter 6 when Moses is giving the law the Lord commands Moses to give this command to the people of Israel he says you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massah what you did back there not okay don't ever do that again so Israel was wrong Jesus cites that command when he's being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, right? In Matthew chapter four. So we see that scenario, an evil and adulterous generation asking for a sign. 
However, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, God speaks through the prophet Malachi and he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. So the Lord says, do not put the Lord your God to the test in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and in Malachi chapter three, he says, test me. So we have passages that are condemning testing God and we have passages where God is telling his people to test him. What are we to do with that? What in the world are we supposed to do? Well, earlier in Matthew chapter 12, I think Jesus gives us the answer. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, in the midst of his disputes with the Pharisees, He gives them another harsh name calling Uh, in verse 34. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so this whole testing God thing is a matter of the heart. The Israelite people in the wilderness were not believing the God that just rescued them. The Israelite people were not believing the God that just delivered them out of slavery and into freedom. But the Lord in in Malachi chapter three, he is speaking to a people who believe, a people who are faithfully bringing their tithes into the storehouse. And he's saying, you guys believe. Let's see what we can do with that. But these scribes and Pharisees, they're not speaking from a place of belief. They have hard hearts. We've already said that. And so they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, okay, all right, we're not impressed. What you got? Something more? We want to see more. We haven't seen enough. We haven't heard enough. They're speaking from unfaithfulness. They have a lack of faith. Do you have a hard heart? Do you have a hard heart? We've all seen the scenes in movies or maybe you've been to the point in your own life where, where we're in the crisis moment and we, and we say, we cry out to God and we say, God, if you're real, give me a sign. If you're real, give me a sign. We have to check our motives all the time. It's something I talk to our students about basically every week. We have to check our motives and look at ourselves from a, from a far away perspective and say, hey, what, why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I saying the things that I'm saying? Why am I making the choices that I'm making? We need to check our motives all the time, but especially when we're asking something from God. When we're asking something from God, we need to be very careful because is our asking something from God coming from a place of faith and obedience or is it coming from a lack of faith and a hard heart? Let's keep walking through Jesus' response here. And we're running out of time very quickly. Jesus says, no sign will be given to it, this evil and adulterous generation, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. There's Jonah, we found him. So Jesus explains that Jonah's stay in the belly of the fish was a great picture for us of what Jesus himself would do in his death and resurrection. Little technical critique here, little side note. Maybe you caught it. He says three days and three nights. And you're like, Good Friday, Saturday, Sunday morning. It's not adding up, Jesus. What are you saying? And so let's take care of that really quickly. In that culture that Jesus is communicating with, He's not talking to us in 2023. That's 
not where he was at the time. He's speaking in the first century. And so in that culture, Jesus is communicating with them and it was customary for them to refer to three calendar days as three days, three nights. That's just cust- a customary term. That's the way it translates over into English, but in the original language, it, they would have said three calendar days as three days, three nights. That's what they would have said. And so Jesus spent part of Friday, all of Saturday, and a small part of Sunday in his tomb. But in Hebrew, it was three full days. So three days, three nights. That's the way that translates. So there, we took care of that one. And so let's look at Jonah and the tomb. The fish, and Alan spoke about this a little bit last week, and it's so good, so strong. But the fish was the vehicle for deliverance. The fish was the vehicle for deliverance for Jonah, for the sailors, and for the people of Nineveh. Right? If it wasn't for the fish, Jonah would be dead. If they hadn't thrown Jonah out of the boat, the sailors would have been dead. And if Jonah hadn't gone out of the boat into the fish and onto the land, the people of Nineveh wouldn't have heard the gospel. We haven't got there yet in Alan's series, but spoiler alert, that's coming. The tomb was the vehicle The fish was the vehicle of deliverance for Jonah, the sailors, and the people of Nineveh, but the tomb was the vehicle for deliverance for us. The tomb was the vehicle for deliverance. Jesus was silent for three days. Then on the morning of the third day, God the Father breathed life back into his son, and Jesus rose out of the tomb. That was the sign of all times. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only sign that we need. Jesus is saying the Messiah will die and be resurrected. That's what he's telling these guys right in front of the Messiah that you know about, that you've been reading about, that you've been memorizing passages about since you were born. He will die and be resurrected. This is the sign. Believe it, trust it, follow it. Follow the sign. We're naturally hard of heart because of sin. So the reality of Christ raising from the dead just isn't enough for us sometimes. Just like the scribes and Pharisees. Let's keep moving very quickly now. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is right here in front of you. Jesus is telling them that the people from the wicked pagan city of Nineveh would testify against them at the judgment before the throne of God because they repented and believed at the preaching of the prophet Jonah. Yet, yet the scribes and Pharisees have Jesus standing right there in front of them, compelling them to repent and believe, yet they do not believe. Jesus, greater than Jonah, was rejected by his own generation. Jesus keeps going. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is referring to the queen of Sheba. She came to visit King Solomon because she had heard of his great wisdom. Let's look at it really quickly in 1 Kings chapter 10. Now, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And she came to Solomon. She told him, that was everything that was on her mind. And Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing hidden from the king that he could not explain to her. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seats of his officials, the attendance of his servants, their clothing, his cupbearers, and his burnt offerings that he offered to the house of the Lord, there was no more breath in her. And she She said to the king, the report was true that I heard in my own land of your words and of your wisdom, but I did not believe the reports until I came with my own eyes and saw it. And behold, the half was not told of me. Your wisdom and prosperity surpasses the report of heard. Happy are your men, happy are your servants who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. Here it is, blessed be the Lord your God 
who has delighted in you and set you on the throne. The queen of Sheba will testify against these scribes and Pharisees at the judgment because she heard the wisdom of Solomon and she went and saw it and she believed. She said, blessed be the Lord your God. She believes in the one true God because she saw the wisdom of Solomon. Yet someone greater than Solomon is speaking to the scribes and Pharisees and they want to see more. They haven't seen enough. This passage should challenge us to examine our faith. Are we truly believing in Jesus or are we constantly looking for a sign because of an unbelieving heart? If we truly believe in Jesus, we do not need a sign. Jesus is enough. When things are difficult, when life gets really hard, when we're totally overwhelmed and everything feels like it's falling apart, Jesus is enough. We need to look at the hardness of heart of these scribes and Pharisees and we need to be terrified. We need to run from that. Like I said, we look at these guys a lot of times and we say, man, what are they thinking? But they're they're us. We need to guard our hearts and we need to believe because Jesus is enough. None of us are perfect. We all fail. We all go through seasons of doubt. We're all broken by sin, but is your life defined by belief and a pursuit to grow? And is your life defined, or is your life defined by a hard heart that is constantly seeking for Jesus to validate himself to you? How is your life defined? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you this morning for your word. God, I thank, thank you for the cross. I thank you for the tomb. I thank you for the resurrection. God, I pray that you would help our unbelief. God, I pray that you would push us to trust Christ more, that you would soften our hard hearts. God, I pray that you would make us obedient to you in all things. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're gonna stand and sing. If you need to come talk to one of us, please do. If you wanna join the church, if you've talked to one of us already, maybe had a membership interview with one of us, we'd love to come talk to you. In Mark chapter nine, a man brings his son to Jesus. His son was possessed by a demon that made him have seizures and he would throw himself in a fire or water trying to make this boy commit suicide basically. And and the man says to Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately the father of the boy cried out, I believe, but help my unbelief.